Hello and welcome to The Genius Podcast. I am your host, Karen Doyle, and I would like to invite you to join me and countless other Catholic women as we not only discover our own genius, but we own it, and then we bring it as a gift to the world and the people we do life with. The Genius Podcast is part of a much bigger initiative for Catholic women called The Genius Project. The Genius Project is dedicated to helping Catholic women discover their unique genius, what it is they are called to do with their gifts and their life. I hope and pray that you will come away inspired and as St. Catherine of Siena said, set the world ablaze with your genius. I am so excited to bring you something really special this week. I am involved with Sisterhood, which is a national Catholic women's movement. We host Australia's main National Catholic Women's Conference, as well as support women to form Sisterhood Connect groups. These groups are made up of approximately five to seven women who meet on a regular basis in someone's home, and they are a beautiful place of support, formation, and prayer. This year, we were four days off hosting our national conference when the world went into lockdown. This left so many women ready to be spiritually fed at the conference, but not able to attend the event. With the COVID shutdown, so many women expressed feeling really isolated, and they expressed a deep need for connection despite social distancing. So the Sisterhood Movement set up virtual Sisterhood Connect groups for women right around the country. And we decided to do a book study on Father Jacques Philippe's book, Searching For and Maintaining Inner Peace. Women met online once a fortnight and worked through the book. We produced a beautiful PDF journal for them to go deeper in their personal prayer time, as well as a podcast which unpacked each chapter. It is this podcast that I am so excited to share with you through the Genius Project. For six podcasts, I am joined by Therese Nichols, a female Catholic entrepreneur and founder of One Plate, as well as Sister Mary Helen, a Dominican sister of St. Cecilia, Nashville, Tennessee. These two women are incredibly special and have been a really important part of my journey. You will see and experience their beautiful heart through our conversation. We had such a blessed time recording these conversations and we really hope and pray that they will be a blessing to you. So we ended last week's podcast with this challenge of saying yes in little ways to the circumstances and to Christ and to finding peace. And I'm interested in how you both went with that challenge. I know we put it out there to the women listening, but we'd be hypocrites if we too didn't practice this. So I I know in my life, the yeses have come just in seeking peace when I'm feeling my blood pressure rising with Um, uh, different things like trying to run our business while trying to homeschool our three kids and just trying to keep the house running and all the, you know, juggling all of that. I think this week particularly there was an example where I was trying to set up the kids schooling on the devices and I had um, business emails coming in for an online platform that schools are using and they were trying to get into that while my kids are like at me to get their stuff set up all the websites were crashing Mm. and I could feel my blood pressure rising and I just walked into the bathroom shut the door and I was just like Jesus please bring me your peace you know in this moment and and just took a moment to ground myself back into the present so like really practical things like you know breathing more deeply just being aware of the surroundings my feet on the ground like really simple things like that brought me back to Mm. myself and then back to finding that place of Christ within me and and tapping into that peace. So I found Mm. myself doing that many times over over the week and the days, just taking a moment, you know, like just pressing pause when you start Mm. to feel agitated or anxious about things. I mean, I'm not generally an anxious person, but uh, I think when we're carrying a lot, and the weight of what we have to carry can stress us out. Mm. I think that's, that's how I've applied it. Just yes to seeking God's peace this week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you? So one of my moments of saying yes is, so as I mentioned um, last time, I'm during this time of isolation, I've, uh, I'm up in the country staying with my family and it's really, it's beautiful here country Victoria and it's been absolutely freezing it's been raining all week it's been a really cold week and so 
I did mention last time how I have this great morning routine where I go um, for walks and exercise and prayer time. But as we slowly go into the depths of winter and it gets colder and colder, the temptation to keep pressing snooze on my alarm clock in the morning is quite high. And so I set my alarm and the snooze button went a few times. But the next morning I was like, no, I had heard of this concept called the heroic minute. Mm -hmm. And it's the heroic minute of when you start the day of will you press the snooze button or get out of bed and pray. (laughs) And usually (laughs) the snooze button wins. But my yes was to say yes to the heroic minute of when my alarm went off and just to turn it off and get straight out of bed, knowing that I needed to have that time of prayer because every snooze, every 10 minute snooze, um, takes some time off that prayer time. So that was my yes. Fantastic. Yes to the heroic minute. Well, no, no, very good. <laughs> good for you. Sister, what about yourself? Well, I'm with you in the school situation. <laughs> and, um, I think for me the yes has been, um, actually we have a saying in the convent, like is it oxygen or is it jelly? Um, basically, you know, is this really important or it really it just doesn't matter? Mm. Um, and trying to just put in the jelly category um, every change of, schedule and <laughs> plan of we're going back to school we're not going back to school we're going back to school <laughs> two days a week no one no year 12 no year 11 um and just and just roll and just roll with it and be happy yeah. and be present so that's been yeah. my yes <laughs> yeah good on you definitely needed that <laughs> sweet I, I think i also uh made a bold call this week where I emailed the teachers and I just said, I just drew a line. I said, we'll do maths and English. We're not doing anything else. <laughs> so <laughs> that was a really good call because I'm like, this is what matters. And what actually matters for me is me maintaining my peace and having a peaceful relationship with my kids in the midst of True. homeschooling and not battling and fighting them. And, and I mean, really, they're actually really good. Like they, they get on, they're quite motivated, but They've, ch- you know, the schools have changed the platforms. It's incredibly confusing. Um, things aren't working. So it's more the stress that comes from that. But mm-hmm. yeah, I made that bold choice too to just say mm-hmm. not yes, but no to all of them. Yeah, <laughs> good. As a math teacher, I, I highly approve. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Oh, so this week we are delving into the second part of part one, points five, six, and seven of Father Shark Philippe's book. And I just love how he begins this chapter where he tells us that basically all reasons to lose your peace are bad reasons. I like how simple that is. And I think it's just a great, like there's not a single reason that is okay to lose peace over. And I just thought that was brilliant. So, I mean, Mm -hmm. we could leave it right there, but we really need to understand why and how to do this. So I like how he breaks down for us three different categories. And he said that it's helpful in discerning where the source of agitation is coming from so we know how to fight the battle accordingly. And he says that there are three places that agitation and anxiety come from. Number one, the world. Number two, the devil. And number three, our own imagination and our own misguided thoughts. I thought that was, I I like structure. I like to see it broken down like that. And it almost gives us a game plan where if we are in a situation, just from reading that, we can go, okay, let's evaluate where this is coming from. I think that's a really good starting point. So let's take a look at each one of these and let's begin with the world. Like as we know at the moment, the world has thrown everybody into a state of anxiety and agitation with this coronavirus and being in isolation, it's really thrown a lot of people. Sister, like you said, just the toing and froing between options, like Mm -hmm. are we going to school, are we not, are businesses (laughs) opening, are they not? Like there's a lot of uncertainty And, and I think as a culture, we actually, and as humans, we find that really hard to deal with, don't you think? Yeah, it's the control thing again. (laughs) We want to control things and we think that by controlling them, then we have peace. But it's, that's not stable. That's that's elusive. Yeah. Yeah. As, as we've learned. Okay. So just in thinking about um, worldly uh, expectations as well, that can take our peace. Um, Sometimes just the pressure of those 
or the falsity of them mm. takes our peace because they're not they're not we're not thinking as God thinks. <laughs> yeah. So I just the sort of things that I see take peace are you know, just the expectations. I'm even talking to my sisters, you know, they're both young moms and the expectations it is on what they're supposed to be doing at this time of their life as a mom. Um, mm. You know, have I, have I got all the right stuff? Am I feeding them the right thing? Should I be doing this or that? And the burden that that is really steals their peace. I've seen that a lot. Yeah. Um, but also I think some other false ideas in the world um, take our peace if we let them latch onto us too like I think one idea is just the sense of entitlement Mm. of I deserve a certain standard of life or I deserve to have pasta every time I walk into Woolies where is the pasta you know like oh (laughs) toilet paper toilet paper come on do you know who I am (laughs) um just these uh that that they can take our piece too because it 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 takes us from a instead of being receiving again you know in gratitude Mm. we are expecting and so then when it doesn't happen we lose our peace Mm. yeah Mm. that's a good insight Mm. and I think also um fear robs us of our peace as well and it's fear on so many different levels fear of um how is how how is this all going to work out with COVID-19 or jobs or work or financial situations or um, children and schooling and the list goes on and suddenly that fear starts to build up and that fear robs us of peace. Um, but I think the best vaccination <laughs> when fear hits <laughs> is the word of God um, and really delving into the word of God and into scripture. Mm-hmm. And so much I think of the fear that wells up within us um, on so many different levels for so many different things can happen from things from our childhood stories we tell ourselves, and then fear turns us into control freaks and suddenly we need to control things and we need to have that, that um, we need to micromanage and then suddenly we're not abandoned to the will of God and we find ourselves in this place of controlling rather than surrendering and then we unravel and suddenly that spirit of peace is stolen from us. So I think fear and the anxiety and depression that we can face through these examples from the world and our own thoughts that come to rob us of our peace, it's so important to plant ourselves in the word of God to mm. overcome that. It's true. I, I was um a couple of years ago I had to give a talk on fear actually. And I sat there and was looking through the word of God and coming up with all of those different situations, you know, classic, what are God's comebacks in Mm -hmm. scripture to all of our different fears? Mm -hmm. And I made a whole list of them. And when you sort it down and squeeze it out and get to the nugget, almost every time his reason not to fear is I am here, I am with you, Mm -hmm. almost every time. And it doesn't matter what we're worried about. Um, what we're missing when we're afraid is his presence. Mm. Um, And so it's really interesting, you know, I have overcome the world, you know, I will not leave you orphans. I am with you. My grace is sufficient. Mm. Do not be afraid. You know, it is I, you know, Um, just every time uh, that's the answer. And I think um, sometimes it's hard to grasp because for so many of us, we read the scripture, we know that God is with us. We know he's our father and he is for us and he wants to give us these great things and that you know heaven's the goal and we have nothing to fear, yet that fear still creeps in. Yeah. And so I suppose it's a question of how do we, how do we manage that and overcome that daily and by praying and getting into the word of God and something that I've grown up with, Every day as we pray Psalm 91 and put on the spiritual mm. armour as mm. a combat to, um, to overcome that daily because it's, um, yeah, it's a daily um, choice that we have to decide not to give in to fear, to overcome it yeah. and to constantly, constantly say, Jesus, I trust in you. Yeah, mm. for, I love Psalm 91. But I think mm. this idea of fear, and this leads us into the second way that we can lose our peace is that of the devil. 
that Mm -hmm. he can really use fear. He can use these situations to bring agitation and to bring anxiety, can't he? Like he he just loves that. (laughs) He loves to mess Mm -hmm. with our heads. He loves to mess with the world. He loves to mess with our peace. And I think that we forget, you know, that we have a God in heaven who number one, has created us in his image and likeness, number two, that he has created us with and for a purpose, and number three, that he wants us to experience joy. He wants us to experience freedom in Christ. He wants Mm -hmm. us to experience all that he intended for us. And I think sometimes we forget that. On one level, we know it. On one level, we forget it. But Mm -hmm. I think we really lose sight of the fact that, yes, we ha- while we have a God in heaven who created us and loved us and is for us, sometimes we forget that we also have an enemy who is against us and an enemy who is hell-bent on making sure we don't experience the peace of Christ in our lives. I can relate to that as well because I do think there are so many examples in our um, childhood and our teenage years that we may be aware of or may not even be aware of subconsciously where something is said by by a random person, by a family member, and it embeds in our hearts and our minds. And as you were saying, Karen, it starts to tell, it starts to shape a story within our life and we hold on to the story yeah. rather than what actually happened and letting it go. Because in the end, what actually happened, it doesn't mean anything. Yes. Yet it's got this hold on our life and it starts to shape the way we live our life. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a, it's a really important, um, I suppose, lesson to learn and to grow in that self-awareness and self-knowledge to, to identify those moments of those lies that have been that we've even told ourselves that are actually not true so that we can grow and that we can overcome when i think about the lies that have become embedded in my heart i recall distinctively our first couple of months of marriage and i remember bringing i guess some old wounds and things from my previous dating relationships into marriage and wounds were I guess I dated this guy. I thought I believed in the whole flirt to convert thing and I, I dated this guy in a hospital in Sydney who wasn't a Christian and uh, it ended up he was a real womanizer and ended up sleeping around the whole time. Thankfully, I I didn't sleep with anyone before I was married. But, yeah, I I think I took that on like a personal rejection rather than he actually had a problem. And so I took that into my marriage without really realising it. And Therese, what you were saying is sometimes we have to, I guess, make time and space to really ask the Holy Spirit to show us and reveal to us the lies in our life because they affect us, but not only do they affect us, they also spill over into our lives and they spill over into our relationships. And for me, that was my marriage to Jonathan. And you know, one day he said, you know, I am not this person. I'm not him. I'm not going to do this to you. I'm I'm a faithful hound. He said, I will never do that. And, you know, I've been really blessed throughout my marriage, but I think that was a really powerful lie. And it really had the potential to make me incredibly insecure and to really, um, to, yeah, to really damage our marriage in those early early months and thank god for jonathan like i often think his name means god's gift and and he truly has been god's gift to me he's always spoken truth into me and over me and i'm i'm so grateful for that but more than that he really encouraged me to take it to prayer take it to the holy spirit and to really ask for a deep healing in my soul and and praise god i have experienced that so for me, uh, a personal example that I haven't really shared that much, but so in primary school, I was definitely one of those students who was not good at maths whatsoever. I was all humanities, communications, arts, yeah. um, but definitely not maths. And I was able to get away with it and nobody really knew until I got to grade six and I had a, a, a teacher who absolutely loved, loved maths and realised that I wasn't great at it. But he was a really hard teacher and he was one of those teachers who would um, ask questions and pick you out in the class. So every maths class, he would 
ask the math, maths question and always pick me out to answer and I would never, ever get it right. So I felt constantly humil- humiliated in maths class. <laughs> and because of that, so a lot of the boys in the class, they were all good at maths and so they started teasing me because I didn't know maths. And I went from this outgoing person, child, to really shy and I started to have this anxiety that every time I was asked a question mm. in class, I would just freeze up and couldn't answer. And so it just, I started to tell myself this story of, I'm not smart. I, I, I can't answer questions. And I just, I got quieter and quieter. And so I was blessed in secondary school that I found a great group of friends and I was able to just immerse myself in the arts and mm-hmm. to a point try and ignore maths. <laughs> but this, but this um, feeling of not feeling good enough, not being, not being able to answer questions, continued. That every time I was in a classroom situation, if there was a teacher who was one of those teachers who wouldn't ask you to put up their hand, but they would pick you, I would just freeze. But it was this story that I told myself that I wasn't smart because of, um, because of that um, scenario. It was just maths, but suddenly I told this story that it was in, in every, every subject. other subject. Mm. Yeah. And so then that's the way that I saw that the devil suddenly got in to break down my self-confidence and Mm. suddenly to withdraw. And so when I sort of discovered that years on, I was able to really pray through that and see the lie that the devil had tried to bring me down within that um, to be able to overcome it. And I think the important thing is when we are able to reflect on different experiences and have that self-awareness and self-knowledge we're able to pinpoint those experiences and then overcome it. It's when we don't realise and don't take the time out to reflect that those experiences continue to breed this mm-hmm. perpetual lie in our life mm-hmm. that we hold on to and it continues to shape our life and we're not able to overcome it because we can't name it. And I feel like that's the absolute key when we can name things mm-hmm. in our life and call it out for the lie that it is. Mm-hmm then we're able through Christ to conquer it and overcome it and move on and walk in the power that God has given us to be daughters of Christ and to be able to live in that peace. And when we live in that peace, that peace unlocks its joy in our hearts. Mm -hmm. And when we have that joy and that peace, that unlocks this great freedom to be completely and totally ourself and I just love that quote of St. Catherine of Siena, if you are who you are meant to be, you'll set the world on fire. Mm -hmm. So when we hold on to the truth of our life, um, of who we are in Christ, which is love, and that unlocks that peace and joy, we're able to be completely free and be who we're called to be. Mm -hmm. But first we have to sit in that reflection of identifying what are those lies that God has told us. I'm sorry, that the devil has told us (laughs) um, and that God can reveal to us Mm -hmm. and God can reveal to us in in that stillness, in that quietness so that we can conquer it and overcome it. Absolutely. And I think we've just got to wise up, right? We have to rise up to (laughs) recognise the voice of the enemy because I think that so much of the time the voice of the enemy is like static background noise. Like we're not even tuned into it. Like it's just there and somehow it shapes who we are. It determines what we put our hand to. It determines the people that we have relationship with or it determines how we allow others to treat us like Mm -hmm. it's just like this static noise going on every day and I think we've got to wise up we've got to recognize his voice and we have to combat it with the truth and the truth that comes from the word of God and I think you know the voice of God has got to become louder than the voice of the enemy and it's just and the only way we do that is really I think to declare out loud the truth the truth of who we are. I am the beloved daughter of God. I am chosen. God's favor rests upon me. I am loved. Like I have a purpose and he he has plans for me. You know, he has plans to prosper me, not to harm me. You know, he is a good, good God and he's a good, good father. And it's who he is. I love that song. You know, it's who he is. That's his nature. So every time you hear the voice, it says, you're never, you're just, you know, you, you're you always, that's the mm-hmm. voice of the enemy. It's condemnation. Yeah. And God never, ever, ever works in condemnation. 
He might convict mm-hmm. you, like he might convict you and give you that sense that something's not quite right, but he will never make you carry the weight of, you know, that burden of feeling like shame and terrible mm-hmm. about who you are. Like that's not yeah. of God. Mm. I think you're right, Karen, that we really need to step in and resist that spirit of fear and claim it boldness mm-hmm. um, because so often we can become, we are more acquainted with the devil's voice than God's voice, that we're actually giving more airtime to what the devil is saying to us and those lies than we are giving to God's voice. And that's where we really just need to stand in that authority and rebuke the evil's voice and to get the word of God into us and to know what the word of God says, not what Google says (laughs) um, and the naysayers says, but what God says and to really make that shift because we know that Christ has already paid the price and we don't want, we can't, let the devil push us around anymore and to fill us with those lies and those messages we need to resist it and take authority over Mm -hmm. that evil absolutely Mm -hmm. true yeah and i think if you contrast what the devil does um in taking maybe real events but twisting them and inflating them and then making them last into other areas of our life with what jesus does in the gospels Because if you think of particularly those encounters where Jesus revealed some really tough truths to, for example, the woman at the well or the woman caught in adultery or even just Martha, um, he revealed some pretty tough truths that, that really pierced into the reality of things that each of them needed to needed healing in. But he did it in such a way that it, that truth healed it didn't it ennobled it brought joy it brought a rush of of um confidence um so so maybe when the track starts playing in our mind tying us up in negative things about ourselves that uh, that we can know immediately that that's not that's not the lord Mm. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. And that ties into this third point that he says about our own thoughts. I think they kind of go together, don't they? <laughs> That's right. Because yeah. I think the devil just jumps on our thoughts. He does. Mm. He does that and all we, the time. And we have the, we have the key to our own thoughts, you know. We, we get to choose what we entertain or what we don't. And um, that's the active part of the battle that we yes. really need to take up more than anything. Mm. And, you know, I think in terms of combating all of these, you picked up on the power of scripture. And I think mm-hmm. it's, it, there's such power in declaring that out loud and mm-hmm. taking authority. I mean, the Bible tells us, and, and like we talked about last week in the fact that this is a spiritual battle and God mm-hmm. has given us the keys of the kingdom already to fight this battle and mm-hmm. he's given us what we need. So we, you know, obviously when we can return to the sacraments, that that's one area, <laughs> standing on the word of God, because it's as true today as it was back then. It's the living word. It has the same power that it had when Jesus spoke. So standing on scripture, declaring it out loud, and I think also worship. I think when we Mm -hmm. worship the Lord, you know, and we enter into worship, it shifts the atmosphere. It seriously changes something. And because we're not just battling in the earthly sense, we're battling a Mm -hmm. spiritual battle. And I truly believe one of the ways we battle that spiritual battle is in worship because, Mm. you know, when we worship, the Bible talks about it. You know, in Mm -hmm. Psalms, David talks about worshipping God and Mm -hmm. we can And we have the power to shift the atmosphere in our mind, in our thoughts, in our life, in our homes, and whatever we do through worship. And I think, you know, if we can just really tap into that, that's that's immensely powerful. My favourite song at the moment is the Bethel song, I Raise a Hallelujah. Mm. And I just encourage everyone to listen to that. It's like a war (laughs) cry. (laughs) Like it's like, because it's we're in battle. And when you go into mm-hmm. battle, I think mm-hmm. worship is one of the tools that the Lord gives us to fight that battle. So, yeah. I believe it. I think, I think uh, Sister Mary Rachel, I don't know if you know people who know her, but um, oh, she. I love her. Oh, Shout out. Love to her. Her. <laughs> we love you. going to start crying. We love her. Come back, please. I know. Come back. <laughs> anyway, well, anyway. <laughs> Keep going. 
sorry. Um, she, we would have this little thing in the convent because, you know, there's a lot of um, silence, but, you know, in a lot of silence, it's, it's a blessing or a curse. <laughs> you, can, yes. you can read things into everything if you like. Um, but when you would ever, if you would ever notice that the, the atmosphere would get sort of heavy, mm. we would have this little code between us of pierce it with praise. Wow. Um, and it was so fun. It actually just made everything fun. We just laugh. Um, yeah. And so that would break it. But the yeah. pierce it with praise and, and was really helpful. And, it, and I think that's something I learned when I was in university. You know, at different times things would get a bit a bit heavy, a bit uh, yeah. And yeah. Um, I remember discovering, I mean, think of, you know, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. They're in a pretty, you know, bad situation in a fire, you know, <laughs> seven mm. times harder than what it was. <laughs> you know, they're in a pretty bad place. And there they are praising God. And so mm. I would pick up their praise um, and it was amazing the transformation that happens. You just just praise, no matter what is going on here. Me, just start praising, and you just shift everything. Just shifts. Mm. Yeah, it's so true. I love it as well, and that's a for me. It's a tool that I, yeah, that I really rely on. My grandmother always used to say, "Be praise centered, not problem centered." Mm. And I find that when we praise, it unlocks. Um, well, it unlocks joy because we suddenly are turning our eyes to Christ and we're grateful. It's praise is um, this gratitude and in thanking God for everything and through that gratitude that unlocks joy. And I just think it is an absolute tool to hang on to that we're taught through Scripture, through the Psalms, is just, um, just praise and it mm. sets our hearts free. Absolutely. I just think uh, my favourite albums, I think it's always good because some people have never experienced worship, right? They they haven't encountered that. And I think if people are looking for some really good worship, I know my favourite album that we're listening to a lot at the moment is a, a Hillsong album called Of Dirt and Grace. And they wrote the songs In the Holy Land. And uh, it's just, it's really beautiful. And the other one is a song that says, tell the devil not today. <laughs> I just, mm-hmm. I love that. I'm like, rack off, go back to hell. We don't mm-hmm. need you here. And um, it's a good song too. But Mm. very powerful um, okay so here's the thing we're talking about peace we'd love peace we all want it now um, <laughs> just one glitch <laughs> so um, the glitch <laughs> is um, you know we're seeking peace peace there could be no peace if there's no goodwill so that's the only like necessary condition so um, one thing that um, Chuck Philip says I think it's on the bottom of page 50 he says, those who oppose God, who, who more or less consciously flee from him or who flee from certain of his calls or his demands cannot be at peace. Mm-hmm. Um, so if we make a project of seeking peace, but we're conscious or maybe not even so conscious of avoiding God or parts of what God maybe is asking of us, if there's a habit there, um, we won't actually find the peace <laughs> yeah. um, that, that we need. So, so it's just um, there's a necessary desire, like good desire, goodwill, mm. not perfection, not have not being perfect, but of at least being being real with God, having uh, integrity, a sort of a unity of who am I and what am I seeking, and if I sincerely seek God with all my mess and you know getting falling down and getting up is fine as long as I've chosen to go forward mm-hmm. yeah yeah it's 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 a good condition an interesting <laughs> one too <laughs> there's a quote in the book where it says it is a firm disposition to love God and to do his will in all circumstances to always say yes to God in the great things and the small Mm-hmm. I just, I really like that. this word disposition, which yes. is like a habit really, isn't it? Like it's a mm-hmm. habit of the heart that we're in, that obviously we won't do it perfectly, like you said, but we are inclined to say yes, like Mary did without really thinking. Mm. Whereas, you know, sometimes I'm guilty that when the Lord asks something of me, I'm like, mm, I just have to think about it. <laughs> so, you know, that would yeah. Bring up into question my goodwill. I would think oh. that. <laughs> but you know, I, that disposition of like, yes, Lord, 
be it done to me according to your will. Yes, Lord, I will do this. Someone asked something of me, my husband, my children, family, Mm. like friends, somebody Mm. wants something, yes, without thinking. I think um, Father Jacques Philippe, did a retreat for us up uh, here in Sydney a little while back um, oh, for priests so and religious. I know it was great. It was really good. Um, but one of the pictures he painted for us, you know, like, in you know, just a mental picture. He said, it's like when you go, you have to live your life and you have to eat the whole plate. And what he means is, um, you know, maybe you're at dining somewhere and you're, some, and you're picking up little pieces of food and um, once you've got stuff on your plate, what you've, what you've been given, you need to eat the whole plate. You can't start hiding things behind plants. And <laughs> like, mm. So in the sense of we, if we can just um, accept everything that comes to us and eat the whole plate, whatever God has given to us, but if we start saying no in something, we are eating away at this goodwill. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wow, I like that mental picture. Mm-hmm. That's really, yeah, it's really helpful. I, I really loved in the book where um, St. Therese is talking with her sister Celine and St. Therese shared the story about a priest doing an exorcism where the demons actually said to the priest, we are able to surmount all difficulties. There is only this bloody dog of goodwill <laughs> which we will never be able to deal with. So, <laughs> but when I read that, I was like, yeah, like if I've got goodwill, you know, the devil and, and the spirits that seek to get to me, like they mm-hmm. can't deal with that. So yeah. in terms of shifting my focus, in terms of looking at, you know, my failures or my weaknesses, but take, you know, it's like that perspective shift, taking mm-hmm. my perspective on what I lack to what I have. What I have is goodwill and to, to put my efforts into growing in that. And to growing in sitting under the gaze of God and, and yeah. spending time with Him because it is precisely in that place that He changes us without any efforts of our own. Like He oh. does that, doesn't He? Like the, mm-hmm. His grace just does that for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, do I think it, how much it must, um, how much He must love seeing our goodwill in trying mm-hmm. that even though um, we're not perfect and we're not saints, but we're trying through this goodwill and we're all in different seasons, but just that trying how he must love that so much and Absolutely. that grace we receive, which builds on our nature. And the more we try through our nature, grace builds on nature, the the more open we are t- to that grace, mm-hmm. to receive grace upon grace. Yeah. yeah. No, I was just picking up what you were saying about sitting under the gaze of God who loves mm-hmm. us because in that uh, story you're talking about, what she was all caught up in knots about were all of her problems, you know, <laughs> all of her faults. Mm-hmm. And actually when God it doesn't look at us the same way that we look at ourselves and mm-hmm. so we, getting used to um, being ourselves with him our real selves with him. You know, Sister Rachel used to talk about peel back the layers, you know, just raw, mm. the, the raw onion there, you know, <laughs> like yeah. peel back the layers of be ourselves with him. He is so patient with the things about us that drive us crazy. <laughs> and, he, you know, he does, he knows them. We don't even know half of them yet maybe, mm. but he knows them and he might leave some of them with us for a while and, um, to heal, like to heal something else that we don't see yet. Um, yeah. He, there's a whole story that he knows and is patient with, and I think that letting it be okay that we are not perfect in our eyes, mm-hmm. but that we are loved by him. Um, whew, that can just, you know, it can actually what like Saint Catherine of Siena would say. You know, that we've got this cloud of self, sort of self-centeredness we can that can start to dissipate and we can look out and see more uh, when we take our gaze off these little things that don't bother him as much as they bother us <laughs> yeah. yeah and I think that's a beautiful prayer to pray to ask God um, to give us a grace to see ourselves and to see others the way God sees us and the way God sees others to see yeah. through heaven's eyes because mm-hmm. when we are able to see through God's eyes we are suddenly um, 
we take our gaze off ourselves and yeah. we see we we see heaven more clearly yeah absolutely yeah so maybe that's our challenge for this week to really pray that prayer and mm. to ask god for i guess his view of us like mm. to really experience his view and to just sit mm. in the gaze of the lord this week that sounds like mm. easy homework i right? like that one yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, many years ago we were leaving for a holiday and I'll, I'll finish up with this story. We were leaving for a holiday and I was trying to find some books and John was like, quick, we're going to get going. And I grabbed this book off his bedside table that a friend had given and it was Henry Nouwen's book, The Return of the Prodigal Son, which I'd mentioned before. And I read it on our holiday and I spent the next 18 months actually reading that one book and just meditating on it. And it's Henry's reflections on the prodigal son. And he talks about the fact that before anything else, we to sit under the gaze of God and to hear him say the words to us, you are my beloved and my favour yes. rests on you. So mm-hmm. each and every woman, like we are God's beloved daughters and he delights in us at the deepest level. No matter what we've done or no matter what our weaknesses or our struggles are, he delights in us and and his favour is upon us. And I think when we can grasp our identity before we're mothers and sisters and businesswomen and anything else we do, we are God's beloved daughter. And I think that's a real challenge for this week, just to sit in that knowledge. I hope and pray that conversation was a real blessing to you. And I really encourage you to take some time before the Blessed Sacrament and allow the truths contained in this little book to really penetrate your heart and your soul. If you are interested in a copy of the PDF journal for each episode, head on over to The Genius Project, www.geniusproject.co and fill out the form on the podcast page. Don't forget your challenge of the week and until next week, God bless you and have a beautiful week.